You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hey guys, it's that time again. Thursday morning and another episode of Mighty Blue and the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis, hits the airways. This is episode number 390 of the show and the date of release in the week of 9-11, which is coming up next Monday, the date of release is significant. We have Earl Porter as our guest today. Earl, or A. Ham, which will mean something to you if you've ever watched the show Hamilton, had what could reasonably be called a difficult life as a youngster. I'm going to let Earl fill you in on this because his story is incredibly inspiring. Taking in a winter sobo of the Appalachian Trail starting on September 11th to raise awareness of veteran suicide. He's a fascinating guy and he proves that adversity can be overcome by application and asking for help. Something that most of us hikers know a little bit about. Earl will be on shortly. And I'm afraid it's another massive show today, with not only all of our surviving class of 23 members reporting in, but also the very popular Dr. Lynn answering a specific question from one of our class members that may well surprise you. Given that we'll likely run to about an hour and three quarters, I'm sorry to report that we'll be missing out for a second straight week another section of George Stephanus's Then the Hell Came. I thought about including it, but a two-hour show is getting a touch too much, don't you think? Two of our members will be completing the trail in the next two weeks, so things should calm down a bit after that. Anyway, let's get to it and meet Earl Chico Porter, known on the trail as A. Ham. Our guest today has had a, to be honest with you, a startling life so far. <laughs> and he's smiling, so I think he, he understands that as well. <laughs> he left home at 14, and then he persevered, as he put it, the judicial system. Then he gained an ROTC scholarship and eventually graduated the University of North Georgia Military College as the number one cadet in the nation. This is Earl Porter. Hey, Earl, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, Steve. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to join you. Well, good to talk to you. And first off, I want to congratulate you on your... Actually, my girlfriend wants to congratulate you on your trail name, which is Aham. Tell everybody yeah. why. Tell everybody why. <laughs> Aham. So I was, uh, it's short for Alexander Hamilton. A uh, buddy of mine, Rob Karcher, treated me to a Hamilton tickets uh, right before I left for the trail. Awesome. And he was pretty motivated. He's another veteran like me. And he was like, man, what you're doing? I, I think we, we got to call you Aham, man. You're, you're trying to spread the good word, trying to get everybody to, to consolidate on common ground. And uh, that stuck. And it just became my trail name from there. Were you Aham or A.Ham? Because the, the song is A.Ham, isn't it? <laughs> it was A.Ham, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. And that introduction that I gave you, of course, only tells a sliver of your story, and there's a lot to get through. So let's look at that early life of yours. Yeah. What gave you the the impetus or maybe the faith in yourself to allow you to rise above that, let's say, face it, difficult early life and successfully, so very successfully, graduate college? Uh, I would say the community. Um, I'm a product of the community of Decatur, Georgia. I was introduced to nature through things like Boy Scouts and um, youth group and a Quaker school that I went to for a couple years. And so when, when I left home, um, those community members gave a little bit more of their own energy and took it from their kids and gave it to me to just help uh, teach me, learn lessons, give me the wisdom to think through. And I, I found myself not in debt, you know, transaction wise, <laughs> but I had a never ending um, commitment to persevere because of the investments other people put into me. I wanted to return on those investments. I mean, you were lucky because not everybody gets that from the community. So what was it within you, you think, that your community saw within you? Um, gratitude. I, I always, you know, I've always found my elders to be insightful. I didn't really have grandparent experiences. So a lot of the, the long talks with adults uh, were normal to me. I, some of my friends were adults uh, because leaving home at an early age, you're just 
you have more relation to people who have already left home than you do people who are staying and, you know, the peers I was going to high school with. Sure. And, you know, I, I tried to practice good manners as much as I could. And I, I think demonstrating, you know, my gratefulness for their, their investments over and over time and time again, when nobody was looking, um, you know, I'd, I'd bring my report card to chief of police Booker who invested in me at a young age, just to, just to see if I was heading in the right direction and where I needed to go. Um, and I, I think they saw a bit of their, their self in me um, in some regard, whether it was the activity I was in or my racial composition. I'm half white, half yeah. black, and I look Spanish. So I kind of, I can blend <laughs> in with anybody, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Chico. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just, I think everyone, I think everyone's good, you know, in their inherent nature. And I, I was somehow able to tap into that good, uh, and and demonstrate that, you know, I wasn't going to waste the energy they invested into me. That was, you know, you clearly ha- had something within you because graduating number one in the nation from your right. college that is such an on- that is such an honor. I mean, yeah. the fa- and but it's it's obviously a product of incredible hard work and a and realization to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and so on. And the irony being, and the reason I mentioned the Aham, of course, that's what he did. He was right. a man in a hurry all the time, always wanted to do stuff and had projects and so on. And I could see those that relationship with you all the time. So you commissioned as an Army Infantry Officer. Where, right. where, where did you serve? Uh, I served first at technically Georgia Tech as a recruiter, a mm-hmm. bar recruiter. I uh, want to mention one thing about that number one in the nation stuff. Um, you know, before college, never won a foot race or a wrestling tournament. Uh, <laughs> and then in college – um, it was my first meritocracy. And so it was the first time me and my peers stepped on one line and we were measured together for our, our contributions to, to the Corps of Cadets. And when I was there, all I was facing was imposter syndrome, not feeling like I was there or, you know, meant to be there. And I, I was trying to keep up with um, these guys, Kevin Bernhardt and Justin Middleton, these two just outstanding Americans. And uh Trying to keep up with them for four years got me number one, got and got one of them number fourteen and number nineteen right, in the nation. Right. So it was it was simply trying to emulate the positive qualities and, and people with, that you know didn't curse, didn't try to go party all the time, different than how I kind of aspired in high school. So it was the same energy I had in high school, but just with some guardrails of the core cadet that got me through. Um, so back to your question, I, I went first to Georgia Tech, did some gold bar recruiting because I needed to get off my state in health insurance ran out. So I needed to get right, back right, yeah. duty orders as quick as possible. Yeah. And then I went down to Fort Benning. I started my training um, as an infantry officer and went to Ranger School uh, and then was stationed at Fort Stewart for most of my career. Um, and I, I just hopped between Benning and Stewart stateside and I deployed to places like Kandahar, Afghanistan, wow. and Azul, Iraq. And what's, what's the period you're talking about now? Uh, so I graduated uh, college 2009, and I did ranger school um, maybe winter of 2009 into 2010, uh, and then graduated ranger school to May 2010, went to Fort Stewart, and by... July, I think, of 2010, I was in Missoula, Iraq, taking <laughs> over 44, you know, adult lives as my responsibility, who've all been deployed for six months at least. And most yeah. of them are their second or third deployment. And here I'm coming, this 22 year old, you know, with minimal life experience, at least at war. And um, I'm supposed to be in charge. And that deployment was, I think we got back 11, 2011, we trained. And in 2012, we deployed again to Kandahar, Afghanistan. And you're still um, a young man then, obviously, as well. So oh, yeah. did you assume leadership? I know I know your rank gives you leadership, but do you did you assume leadership um inherent was that inherent within your nature, do you think? Um inherent, I don't think so. Uh, but I was introduced to leadership at a very young age. I got into JROTC. A junior ROTC at the high school level and Boy Scouts. Right. And I was able to learn from people like Colonel Phil Baker, Colonel Stewart, uh, Scoutmaster Trey Palmer, um, what it meant to be a servant leader. So they were leaders that practice one style of servitude um, instead of like tyrannical or, or stressing these other sure, levers sure. of leadership. And um, 
the army, by the time I got to college and went on active duty, they gave me the, the more holistic every day. This is how you live and breathe it. Um, so it, it felt like my sport. You know, everybody else played baseball their whole life or they played this their whole life. But I was I was into some leadership development my whole life. And so I felt I felt that I was it. I was kind of on my divine journey, if you will. I remember finding solitude uh, a lot during deployments and just looking up at the sky and having a spiritual moment to, to realize this is what I this is what I was trained for since 14. Yeah. Um, sounds like and, it. Sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I especially the shot group of infantry were, were rural America and urban, urban poor. And those were two shot groups that are categories of people that I related most with yeah, because sure. Boy Scouts mm-hmm. took me out to the rural area and I was that urban, you know, disadvantaged youth. Uh, so it was really easy. So, we're going to talk about PTSD later, but what was the impact of those tours of duty on your own psyche? They're still impacting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they're eternal. Uh, once you, once you're introduced, there's, there's bells that ring that you can't unhear. Um, sure. Whether that's in the tangible sense of an explosion or learning of a loss of someone that you, you can't quite process at the time. Right. Um, and there's, you know, missions that still come back today that I've completely forgot about up until yesterday or, or whatnot mm. or images. Um, but on the, on the, that's on the negative. On the other end, of the, it, it was that first time that I realized, like, we're all in the same boat. I was I was fighting in, you know, country that I read about in the Bible uh, with people who believe And, uh, you know, a religion that looks a lot like Christianity and, you know, you see a lot of the same circumstances that we we faced at home and how people got to putting a hundred foot of wire in the ground. Mm. You know, it's it's never the mastermind that was out there that we were fighting. It was always a disadvantaged person that, you know, fifty dollars was a lot or, you know, they were also facing a knife on the door that said your family will be will be gone if you don't do this mission, you know, whatever they're doing. Um, so, you know, it, it's a long lasting effect, a kind of lifelong lesson on empathy, um, for the, the people that I was working with and I was responsible for bringing home and then the the enemy and the the people who were in between, uh, that had nothing to do with the fight. So you, you went through all of that once again, at an incredibly young age and, but in 2016, you transitioned from the army back into civilian life. And yeah. of course, having already been introduced to you already, our listeners will know you did something pretty cool. So what did you do when you get, got back to civilian life? Uh, so I had been applying in the army to go to law school. And the the rationale there was I wanted to be a, a present husband and father as a lifelong goal. And at the time I was engaged, newly married, uh, and I have this childhood that lacked, you know, positive parental influence. And I kept watching myself deploy over and over and be away from home. And, mm. and so I went and asked, I did a, a soul search mission in Afghanistan. You know, more frankly, my men were like, hey, you seem like you're, you're, you're out of, you're not here right now. We need you to go brainstorm what's going on in your life. And, and that led to asking myself, like, why did I become an infantry officer? And that was because of wanting to be like Colonel Baker. And so I asked, like, who else do I want to become like? And that was the lawyer who represented me when I was 14, Dorothy Murphy. And so she represented my rights as a, as a juvenile viciously and how I, I emulated myself as a leader in combat. And so I was like, hey, OK, I like law and order. I'll go to law school. And so I applied to the, the uh, law school route, a program called Funded Legal Education Program in the Army. And I spent a year applying. And you're basically asking your vocations leaders to, to recommend you go to a different vocation. So the Army, we went through sequestration that year. They didn't let as many people as they normally do go to that program. And I had a low LSAT score. Uh, the Army ended up saying, no, you're not smart enough to go. Uh, I had learned to think differently when I was growing up. So I had, I had already applied to the law schools. Emory Law School said, 
we'd love to have you and we'll pay you to come or, you you know, <laughs> give you some scholarship money. And so at that point, it was a no brainer of, OK, I'm transitioning. So I made that decision in 2014 and I, I taught at the infantry's schoolhouse my last two years in the army right. to, to mm-hmm. kind of give back to the next generation as I prepared to go to law school. So and I read this a few things about you this morning, which I thought were fascinating. You said that your wife at the time said to you, because you, you weren't sure which school you could get into, she said, make the people with resources tell you no, which is a great, yeah. great line. Is that something of a creed to help you navigate those no's in life? Oh, my gosh, yes. And, you know, all, the worst thing someone can do is tell you no. So that that was ironic because that was a, a mantra that I had used in our relationship at the time a lot. To, to try to explain my then wife how to how to navigate uh, hardship, and then her giving it right back to me, it was uh, it was just one of those circle of life moments. And for me, Emory growing up was the uh, the Harvard of the South, and my LSAT score did not say I should get into Emory by a long shot. So you know, I think I was three beers in when she said it. I went ahead and wasted the fifty dollars. And the funny thing is. When I applied, I applied to about six or seven schools, and Emory was the, the highest ranking school. And, and as you went down, it was waitlist, waitlist, no, 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 you know, <laughs> to all these places that my scores said I might should be able to get into. Um, so it was really ironic, and I'm grateful for that. And from what I understand, you unfortunately divorced, and, and I, I resemble that remark. It's happened to me several times. Um, after your divorce, you were looking for a purpose to serve. And I think we're talking about 20, 20 I, well, we won't talk about, I'll cut that bit. Um, after your divorce, you were looking for a purpose to serve and you turned inwards to your community. What was your community at that stage? Yeah. So we're, you know, we're in 2020 at this time or 2021. And I had since done three years in the national guard, uh, three years of law school, uh, passed the bar exam, and I was entering my third year as a big law attorney at Austin Bird. And, you know, I decided to divorce May 21. And what I remember sitting at my best friend's house and, and going through an acronym called SAVERS every day, which stands for Silence, Affirmation, Visualization, Exercise, Reading, and Scribing. Oh. And I would I would do this. I was on PTO. Um, I would do this normally 10 minutes per letter per morning. And those first days in June, you know, I might spend all day in silence or half a day more realistically. And then a couple hours of doing affirmations or visualizations or exercising. And my rule during that time was to just focus on building myself and maintaining my mental health. And I was going to uh, my community looked like the people I grew up with, uh, my sister, the medical, you know, I started going to doctors a lot more, shamans, uh, um, mental health professionals, uh, physical therapists. And, and after about a week, it became really relevant to me that the, the angst that my peers were going through as veterans that I was still keeping calls with probably once a week with very, you know, people that I, I fought war with or trained or whatnot. Sure. They were going through a hardship so much worse than mine as we were preparing to withdraw from Afghanistan. And so, you know, I was I I was in my own reflections trying to figure out, you know, what what to do. And I went to what did I do in a similar situation? And that for me was leaving home at 14 and real hard decision um, to leave your mom. and, And what allowed me then to transmute hardship was presence, being authentic, asking my community for help and staying connected, gaining and maintaining my energy and serving. And so I just reconstructed that that device and I asked, what is the highest purpose I could serve right now? And when I say my veteran network was going through things, we we it's pretty well documented that there's a high suicide rate for veterans. And uh, around that time, the anecdotal evidence was it's it's increasing since COVID and since all this kind of lack of collective purpose at the war level. Um, and I was losing people at a rate that was just unbearable. And, and I, I, I would like to say that because because I noticed 
when we spoke before, you said it was kind of kind of stark thing to say. You said you you, you said you've been around suicide for a long time, but you actually said it tra- yeah. it trails me in life. Yeah. So so yeah. how does that make people who know you feel? For, you know, I mean, I'm not making a joke of it, obviously, but you know, yeah. it's kind of it, it trails you in life. That must have a deep impact upon people when people you actually know yeah. commit suicide. Um, there's a phrase in the Ranger Creed, the Army Ranger Creed, um, where it pros is that I'm a specially selected and well-trained soldier. And I remember in meditation that coming to my mind when thinking about veteran suicide. And as I dug deeper in my thought. You know, I remember three distinct suicides growing up that were close to my network. One was my roommate in the children's home when I was growing up. He was anticipating his father adopting him. And on the day of adoption, his biological father committed suicide but walked across the highway. And I remember coming home to a group of kids standing around a TV laughing and my roommate not talking to me. And eventually I put two and two together that the news coverage they were laughing at was this guy's father passing away and i remember then the woe is me you know that i was narrating to myself about why i had to leave home at 14 was nowhere in comparison to this gentleman and i watched his life go from you know very active basketball player uh to mute and just you know distraught beyond belief uh, and, and as time fast forwarded, the judge that sat on my case, who eventually became my mentor, Judge Robin Nash, um, he ends up taking his life uh, right as I commissioned in the army. Uh, and, you know, that one never sat well because he gave me a book when I was in his chambers uh, called A Million Little Pieces. And it's it's the book that underlies Requiem for a Dream as a movie. And uh, it's about a heroin addict putting their life back together. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself, how did I not catch that at 14, Mm -hmm. even though I was 20, 20 something by the time he took his own life? Um, And he was a clinic, you know, a a man facing hard mental health that moonlighted his juvenile justice service in Africa doing humanitarian aid. And then when I was at um, a mentor that I gained from North Georgia, that that, uh, you know, retired military, beautiful career ends up taking his life. Wow. And that was all before 2013, I believe, in which we learned that veterans were taking their lives at 22 a day. Sure, uh, sure, sure. So I felt specially selected. So this is where I want to move on to, to the hike itself, because, you know, we haven't actually talked about the hiking yet, but it, it, this is all leading up to it because the AT kind of it was a manifestation of your desire to serve, wasn't it? What were you looking to get from that hike originally? I know it didn't kind of work out the way you expected, but yeah, t- tell us about what you were looking to do. So I, I decided probably June 21, I wanted to do this. And I started asking my community for help. And that became a team about half veteran, half civilian that met with me by Zoom weekly from the point in which I, I decided to do it to the point in which I finished doing it a couple weeks after. And you know, what we were trying to do was raise awareness and resources for veteran mental health. Mm-hmm. We wanted to, we partnered with Toughest Kids Initiative. We became a project of an already existing 501c3. And uh, they had already had a trust fund going for Gold Star families who are veterans left behind, or families of veterans that are left behind, especially, you know, disabled youth and disadvantaged youth. Sure. Now we were the White Star family carrying trust. Uh, project called something out of nothing and we we wanted to get a million dollars and it distributed out to 22 different entities that was like the bottom line goal the anecdotal was we wanted to do something very hard to demonstrate to at least one veteran that someone out there cares so they make a decision not to you know find a temporary solution or a permanent solution to a temporary problem um and that was our, our anecdotal litmus test. Can we just get one better and to make a better decision? It's funny. It was well, not funny, but it, it's it, interesting to me, having looked at your story this morning and, and what you've done, a theme that runs through it all the time, and it, you do it yourself, is that it's okay to ask for help. Was that a natural lesson for you to learn? And is that particularly difficult for others, do you think? Oh, 
natural. I don't think I had a natural inclination. I don't, I, I really still don't like feeling like the dumb person in the room at some level. Oh, but I used to, I do, I do all the time. Right, right. <laughs> but then at a young age, I realized there was no way to make it on my journey without others. And um, it's through the service of others that you heal your wounds. It's an early lesson that I learned. And so asking others for help is allowing them to serve you. And so like in an in a overarching sense, it, it, it gives people the opportunity to share in that experience. Um, and I, I think it's hard now, especially if you never, if you've not gotten used to it through your adult life or, or aspired to, if you start trying at 35 to ask for help, it seems pretty daunting. Uh, but at a certain point, it becomes habit. And so now I'll jump into counseling, you know, just to think through a plan a little bit better. It has nothing to do with being, you know, kind of cornered in my in my head on a problem. But I, I found that getting help from others, certainly when I was hiking, and I didn't hike till I was 61 first time, um, getting help from others was something that actually happened out there. And so you got on a trail that has that natural helping thing. Trail magic. On, tra the trail magic itself. And you actually started your hike for, for very obvious reasons on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 going southbound from Katahdin. Um, but that was making it a winter hike for much of the way. Yeah. How prepared yeah. were you? Because you're out of the army by now and you're a civilian. Or were you? did you stay in shape? Because it must have been tough in those early stages. I was in decent shape, but uh, law school and big corporate law doesn't <laughs> isn't conducive with working out all really? the time. <laughs> um, but honestly, I, I, resist, or I, didn't, I was pretty resilient on the trail. And my preparation was more spiritual and flexibility purposed than it was strength training and walking long distances with a backpack. I learned in the army, that's how you hurt yourself. And we walked very long distances with backpacks. Um, and so this time, you know, around, I got to use Patagonia, not general issued, you know, equipment. Um, so there were some perks. And then I also had a buddy who was uh, going to go with two, two gentlemen went with me. Um, so of that team of community supporters that got behind my project, um, two of them were on the trail with me. One drove a truck, uh, with a 15 foot camper behind it because we were going winter southbound mm -hmm. tail end of COVID. There wasn't, you know, there was nice trail magic for the first few States, but eventually it evaporates. And then my buddy, uh, Derek Spiker, uh, started off the trail with me, but unfortunately, uh, hurt his knee. It was like shortly after hundred mile wilderness, but he kept doing day hikes with me till about, uh, I don't know, maybe January or December. Wow. And um, yeah, we planned though that I needed to be able to do it by myself. Uh, and so, you know, going into it with that mindset and with the mission, I mean, you know, there's something that takes over you when you walk for people who no longer exist or you walk for a cause as purposeful as getting our veterans to stop taking their own lives. Mm. Uh, and so at a certain point, it wasn't, it, it wasn't up to me either. I had that, not adrenaline, but momentum Yeah, uh, to finish the job. But you were spreading awareness of the message along the way. How, how were you doing that? And how did people receive that message? Uh, people, um, people were very supportive. Uh, we invited people to walk with us. Mm. Uh, I got members of the Pennsylvania National Guard to come out with me for a drill day. Very walk. cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was able to stay, you know, meet at some American Legion, stay at some American Legions on my off days. And um, my law firm at the time, Austin and Bird, allowed me to do a panel discussion in the firm one day. Cool. Uh, I think it was Veterans Day. And, um, you know, either by correspondence through social media, you know, we're on Facebook, Instagram. We did a couple fireside chats on on YouTube with mental health players. And then we were also able to stop at the Library of Congress and do a, a veteran history project interview. Um, wow. While I was in DC, talked to a, a few people and, and walked some good lanes. I was wondering about that because we've talked about community. The community is very important to you, obviously, but you know, you started pretty late for a southbound hike. And, yeah. uh, and so you're going to get solitude out there as well. Yeah. Did, you know, because of, PTSD we talked about. I'm going to come back to it again in a minute. D did you, were you comfortable with that solitude or is that something that the, the being in nature, the solitude in nature, was that working for you as a person? It was tough. Um, what we would do is 
you know, internally to my team, I had daily communication. Um, if I didn't have someone out there with me, you know, I'd be letting someone know I'm going down, I'm waking up for the morning, this is where I'm stopping. Um, and, you know, it was comfortably uncomfortable. So I think that my time in the infantry, uh, something we, we tried, we aspire to do is be more comfortable than other people in uncomfortable circumstances. So <laughs> to your average person, I'm, I'm thinking I did better with the solitude than anyone, but doing this as a nonprofit project would added a different layer. So as we started walking, we weren't getting to the million dollars that we hoped to at, at, at any speed and we never actually got close. Um, and so there were times when I'm out there driving myself stir crazy and my team's having to walk me back and say, hey, man, remember why you're out here. Sure. The, the money parts are secondary. Um, you know, the people you're helping are primary. And, and you, incidentally, are getting all this nature and getting help and getting to spread the word uh, by mouth. And so, you know, there were peaks and valleys sincerely uh, because a good day was veterans calling and saying we had a positive impact on their life. And so when you weren't getting those calls, you're just wondering and you're not making the fundraising goals that you were hoping for. Sure, what, sure. You can kind of box yourself into a different reality. And so every Thursday I came out and my team made sure, you know, to, to check me down, talk about where we're going next and what we're doing to, to stay, stay present. You know what I mean? Not get lost. Cause one, one of the things that came back from childhood while I was out there, I had to forgive myself, uh, the kid inside me that thought maybe he had something to do with not helping people take their own life in my sure, early experiences. Sure. And I remembered mantras from, so I got to spend some time with uh, Alateen, which in the States is, you know, Alcoholic Anonymous, uh, their sub project for teenagers wow. somehow influenced by alcohol or addicted parents. And I learned there, you know, when we're present, it's all good. It's a life is good. When you lean forward, it spells out anxiety one letter at a time. And when you lean back, it spells out depression one letter at a time. <laughs> and so just stay present and it all makes sense. You get an equilibrium. And, and when I was out on the trail, there were days when I literally just had to take off my gloves, grit the cold, hug a tree, like be right there in the moment because I would get lost in space on, oh my God, I thought we were going to do this thing and that thing, and it didn't manifest uh, as we thought at some point. You know what? But once again, I, I, I often bring lots of experiences in life back to what happens on the trail. You learn lessons. You learn that you you know you can make a plan, many plans as you like. On the trail, they don't. You, you don't have a plan that ever works. You just have to work. You have to roll with it and manage your expectations. And 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 reason that I say that actually is because I want to talk about um, post traumatic stress right now for a minute. I read something you wrote. You said post-traumatic stress doesn't require combat, but rather there's a gap between our deepest expectations and perceived reality. Explain that, how it, what that means to you. And were you talking about yourself or others or both? Every, myself and others at all time. Um, you know, in the, in the faith-based sense, they'll say suffering is the gap between expectation and reality. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when we have our intellect jump in and it gets deeply rooted, I thought I was going to be a, this when I grew up, or I thought I'd be married by this age, or I thought pregnancy would be easy or, you know, whatever. I thought combat would be hard and it wasn't. Those deep-rooted expectations not meeting with reality, um, they can cause, you know, post-traumatic stress. And if you know, I think for me, my first jaunt into this direction was I expected to live, live at my home, <laughs> you know, as a kid uh, and till 18 and it didn't happen. Um, well, you know, what work was done on the front and the back end of that often correlates to whether or not you're going to have some long term effect uh, negatively. And so I remember my first three, four years in counseling and how much I resented the whole process and <laughs> drug my heels. And now I can jump into something like counseling and, you know, it takes shorter amount of times to get through daunting hardships. Like I, I just lost, I lost my mom last December and that was a very um, surreal event. So while I was out there on the trail, I, you know, came I manifested a goal that I wanted to be there for my mom as she was there for me when I came into this world. And that was a, a big 
you know, task or, you know, goal to, to ask for because we had been estranged for years. And, um, you know, this last December, I got the, we, we learned pretty late that she was in the hospital and I got three or four days with, with her that reconciled my entire hardship growing up. Wow. She went from antagonist from, for 30, 30 years, she was the antagonist in my narration. And she is certainly a protagonist now. Wow. That, wow. That work that I did on the trail, before the trail, and since the trail set the conditions for me to see the opportunity and have the resilience to be there as she she exited the world in a pretty a pretty traumatic fashion, but a pretty uh, reconciliatory manner as well. And within a couple days or weeks, I'm using that experience to help other people transmute hardship, you know, while seeking my own type of help to go through. And I think being totally transparent and honest and forthright with your counsel or your counselor, however you look at it, uh, gets you through that hardship uh, more efficiently. This may be an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it. If you don't like it, I'll cut it out. <laughs> yeah, sure. Have you ever considered suicide? Have I? Because you're, posi- you're a positive guy. You come across incredibly positive <laughs> yeah. type A yeah. personality. So ha- ha- was it something that's ever crossed your mind? It has in the passive sense, not in the I want to kill myself active sense or how could I. There's so many is nuance in this space sure. um, that your average person might not think about. But um, passive passive suicide, yes, I, I, I'm afraid of heights. So when I'm an airborne ranger jumping out of an airplane and I'm the first one to jump, I am thinking about the thousand ways this could go negatively or there was a time on the trail when I fell uh, in Maine and I, I had the option of rolling down this big hill or this mountain or grabbing some all, you know pretty jagged limestone and slashing my hand open. And I grabbed that limestone and throughout that whole ordeal, I passively thought, what happens if I let go? What happens if I fall? Those are all passive suicidal ideations. Um, so yes, in that technical sense, but you know... I never reached it on the other end and I don't, I don't care to expect to never reach that. I think life will bring that to everyone at some point. Um, if you're living, you know, if you've really put in stock into the people that you're interacting with, sure, um, sure. And I, I'm really fortunate to help people when they're in that space. But suicide seems to be one of the, or PTSD anyway, and maybe then as an extension of suicide, it appears to be one of the, inevitable but awful aspects of a nation going to war. You've clearly devoted a lot of thought to this issue, and I'm sure you did when you were out there as well. I'm not asking you to come up with solutions, but how does this country move in a direction to in some way mitigate this illness? Or do you see solutions or even the beginnings of a solution? Um, I think we got to break down what what the terrain looks like, uh, you know, in this space. Uh, I'm going to borrow... Uh, a reference from a guy named Greg Washington who walked from Mount Bayou, Louisiana to West Point, And he finished the September 11th that I started the Appalachian Trail. He was who gave me a lot of the ropes on how to walk in this space, which is very dark at times. Uh-huh. Um, he references complex grief as a triangle that, you know, a lot of mental health areas describe uh, isolation at one apex, toxic relationships, and financial stress at the other apex. Mm. And veterans, he articulated, and I very much believe, um, are are categorically at a higher pressure on that complex grief triangle than other civilians. And when any human hits 100%, whether it's the apex of isolation, you become 100% isolated, or uh, financial stress or complex grief, or excuse me, or uh, toxic relationships, that human will think in inhumane ways. We're fragile. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's just what it is. And veterans, when they get out of uniform, hit 100% isolation. Dependent, it might go down a couple notches because they keep connections with people that they were in with, or they're, you know, they've been a civilian longer than they were a veteran, and it's pretty, pretty easy to it, but they self isolate there. And then sometimes we do it even worse to ourselves. And so my project picked one of those apexes, isolation, and we just wanted to breach it by way of connection. Mm. We wanted 
during the winter following Afghanistan withdrawal, when we knew it was going to be harder than normal for your average veteran, we wanted them to feel like they could connect to us or their community, or the community could learn through us how to connect to those veterans. And so, you know, projects like that, I think are, are the, you know, they, they give clues to what the answer could be. And since I've been back, you know, while I was on the trail and since I've been back, we were analyzing who were those 22 entities that we wanted to give money to. Why 22? One, for the veterans. Two, because it's like 36,000 um, veteran organizations out there. And so we haven't gotten through the problem by quantity alone. So we were looking for quality. And there's things like Hero Agriculture, um, Comfort Farms, Veteran Farms in North Carolina, where they are taking um, – you know, space land that's not used sometimes because the, the farming community is aging out and there's no succession in the heirs property sense to a sure, younger sure. body that wants to do it. And they're finding veterans who lack purpose and they're getting them trained up on how to run a farm business, even if they've never touched a plant like that. And then, you know, trying to get them to navigate the hurdles of getting land or capital to open their own. Uh, but agrotherapy, wellness, these are all tools that can help respond, but there's got to be proactive effort too. And so before the veterans getting out, you know, it's, it's work that has to be done. Sure, uh, before sure. someone comes into the military, there's probably work that could be done because we all come with our own baggage. So you've, you finished your hype now, obviously you've done that and that's not, that's a, a past part of your life, but you, did you take positive effects from you as a person Forget all the other stuff for a minute. For, for you, Earl, as a person, or A. A. Ham, which is even better, as a person, <laughs> what did your what did you take away from from the hike? A real positive impact on you? Oh, you know, um, there's a there's a saying that's been stuck in my my mind lately, where it's one day or day one, you decide, and that basically truncates. You know, a lot of the good ideas we have out there. And I there was no going to the Appalachian Trail and hiking it because people told me to. There was no not even people encouraged me to. There was a lot of uphill just to make the rational decision to go and hike that trail. And I, I was able to do it, complete it, and come back and, and I think what it's done for me is to to remind me constantly to live more presently, uh, every day. And so I life hacked a little bit. You know, I came back, I sold my cars. Uh, I had two trucks at the time and I sold them because I was working at big corporate law and there was no way for me to unplug from this matrix. I mean, it was just, it was day in and day out high stress, sure. but I could get rid of the, the 30 minute stress of driving and the car payment and the insurance and, and walk to work. And that made me plan a little bit more how to get to work and, once I'm on that walk, man, it was nice to to find nature or or whatnot on my day, and to have that instead of the commute, it it was it's one example of how I've just slowed down um, and and tried to stay in the moment. But you're a guy who's always need is going to need something in his life, you know, a project of some sort. Is this this agri uh, which ag agritherapy or something? Is that something that you're interested in getting involved more in? Isn't it? Very much so. Um, so I'm like a four year old attorney, and <laughs> I uh, I hope to one day, you know, help build community by way of agriculture, wellness, leadership development. I found myself since being back from the trail, uh, coaching um, specifically men how to transmute hardship, how to um, make the most out of their opportunity, or change some type of mindset or behavior. Um, and I've done a wellness retreat and. You know, that that felt to me like I was in my comfort zone. Uh, three days, uh, North Georgia, helping guys with basic skills. And by day three, doing a culminating exercise with all those skills. Um, I think, and I don't know if it's, you know, soon or later, but I, I'll keep hunting in this direction because as I visit the, the hero agricultures, I'm watching magic before my eyes. I'm watching people come in with no faith that they're going to find hope or purpose and and lo and behold they're able to find it you know sow it and reap it with using mother earth sure. and 
Sure. I think anyone who's on this podcast knows that nature heals all. You might not be able to explain it or understand it, you know, per se have command of it, but we are we are in this bigger picture that only makes sense when you get out in the nature sometimes. Is I just want to return for the last question to something that happened obviously a little while ago when you got divorced. Are you now in a position to be a present husband and father? I know you're not you're not married again, are you? No, not no. married. So, 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 are you in a position to be a present husband? You know, because you said you're aiming towards being a present husband and father. Do you feel that's where you are now? I'm, I'm moving in that direction. I have a wonderful girlfriend. She's, we've been together for about a year, and she's got a four year old. And I am able to, uh, you know, scratch at what that picture looks like, right, and get nice. get nice. immediate feedback that like this is the goal I should have been having for the last decade and a half. Uh, I, I'm not aimless, right? Mm-hmm. And and what now becomes the question is what enables me to be the most present? Um, because, you know, that was my little personal mission statement to go to law school. And so when I got divorced and I wasn't a husband and I had no children, the game just became how do I gain presence? <laughs> and that's when you know you've got a good mission statement when you can just erase a word and go back to the first word. Uh, and so I'm get, I'm getting there. I'm a present uh, boyfriend and you know masculine influence. That's what I'm at right now. That's Hopefully, going to cool. graduate one day. That is so cool. Well, look, I, I'm I'm honoured you came on. I think you're a great guy, and you've got you have such a a way of articulating the issue. I, and I normally speak much more, but I thought you had so much more to say than I did that the, oh, it, it, it was good for me to listen to you telling telling your story. I'm I'm glad you came on the show and I can only wish you well in the future. Thank you so much, sir. Can just, I love what you're doing. Please keep telling these stories. Uh, the, the story I would be remiss if I didn't bring up is Eric Schaefer, or Earl Schaefer, Earl Schaefer the yes. first Appalachian Trail through hiker, a veteran walking off, the loss of his best friend in, in Iwo Jima. Um, we all, you know, have something to learn uh, from the people who've gone before us. And the way they say it is, uh, in those that go before us and in those that now go, there burns an eternal flame. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, man. Well, look, good to talk to you. Um, you take it easy, okay? And stay stay, right. stay present. <laughs> Cheers. You. Bye. What a grounded man he is. And so very sincere in his desire to serve. So what that he didn't raise the money he wanted to raise? His heart was in it. He's a fantastic example to many people who could take a leaf out of his book. And while I'm not a military guy, coming first in your nation at anything is pretty much a big deal. So he must be something to have achieved that. And talking about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, I never heard a word of self-pity from him and was intrigued by his reference to the importance of mentors. We all need someone. And Earl certainly had his, and he will be a fine mentor to many, I'm sure. Now, our class of 23. First up, let's hear from our flip-flopper via Iceland, Joanne Flagg. Good morning, Steve. Hey, Joanne, how are you? I am good. And you're top of the priest, apparently. (laughs) Pretty close. The closer I got, the less service I had. I had to back up a little. (laughs) Oh, right. So now you're going, obviously, south uh, southbound now so you went down yeah. i can't remember like was it twin rivers or something like that. they went down the, you were on this ridge or t- three ridges or something like that we down into a in, well, there's a river down the bottom then you go straight back up the priest don't you yeah how was yep. that how was that for you <laughs> uh, well it's getting steeper and uh, it doesn't feel any faster than up north because it's a lot of trail to get up a mountain the way it switched back. So oh. sometimes you're hiking faster, but it's longer. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So you were expecting this to be a bit easier, were you? <laughs> <laughs> they all told me I was going to fly down here. Yeah, they were lying. They, they all told me. <laughs> they, were absol- they were absolutely lying. But, you know, it, it is definitely it is definitely easier. And, and, I, and I think, you know, it's different, obviously, and it's not as, not as epic, but there's still some lovely hiking still to do. And... You've only just got back on because you went back home for a quick trip to see your for your mother's ninetieth. How what does she think about what you're doing? Um, she says she doesn't worry. She she thinks my shenanigans are a little crazy. She doesn't <laughs> understand it. It's nothing that interests her. Um, but she likes to see pictures. I bought her one of those um, electronic digital frames so nice. I can send her pictures almost every day. So. 
Well, that, that's nice. So the, the, they they just appear on the frame as you send them. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yep, <laughs> isn't that amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But one thing that's really good for her and that she enjoys, especially at her age, is um, talking to people who also are seeing um, my posts on Facebook, right. and so it's fun for her to have a daughter who who's doing things that people enjoy and are are looking at and can talk to her about. So that's I'm nice. Sure. I'm, I'm sure. I, and also I think we had this conversation with somebody the other day that uh, it's always nice to set eyes on the person who you feel is putting themselves in danger, you know, just so she can see you and hug you and see you're okay. I would think that's, that's, that's a nice thing for her. And I suspect it's a nice thing for you because, you, you know, your mother's 90. So to, for you to have seen her, is she, is she quite well? Yes, she lives independently. She drives. She wow. mows her own lawn, Does acre, she? two acres, whatever it is. I don't know. Oh, good lord, that's amazing. Well, yeah. Well, bless her, <laughs> bless her. And, and and then you went on to say something which I thought was quite interesting. One thing about going home is that I have to acknowledge the events that occur regularly in my life that I miss, and I have a good regular life. Does it have a pull for you to get off the trail at any stage, or you just now you're just honed in on you know you're 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 focused in on what you want to do, um, or or is is, your, is home starting to pull you a bit? Um, there are this time of year, especially. I grew up showing cattle at all the county fairs mm. and, and local fairs, so I always say that's in my blood. Like, I go to my local fair, I have to go twice to have enough time to soak it all in. So that is one thing that really pulls strong for me. Um, And I do not want to come back on trail, but it's something. And that just is part of me that's missing. The canning and the freezing of vegetables, kayaking on the river, different things like that that have been part of me my whole life. And so then it, it and that, is different. Well, it, it, you know, it kind of should be different. You know, you, you're, we're out there for an adventure, which is different from our everyday lives, I suspect, and for most of us it is anyway. And uh, so it, it, that is for you as well. And, and, and as one of our other guests said a few weeks ago, this is, this is time limited, isn't it? This is not going to last forever. You know, you've got a, this period of time that you're going to be away and then you'll get back to your normal life and do whatever it is you want with your normal life after that. Yes. Yep. And the coming and going, the other thing you said, which I, I thought was interesting, the coming and going from trail is always interesting and where you find the most generosity. What do you mean by that? Um, because that's, well, for me, that's when I need the most, like getting off trail. I decided to hitch down to Devil Backbone Brewery because nice. I needed to get there. I had a friend driving two and a half hours after work uh-huh. to come and get me and run me up to the airport, stay wow. overnight at the hotel, run me into the airport at four o'clock in the morning. And then she was driving back home to go to work the next day. Good Lord. Yeah. And, and it's just all those kinds of things. I come back, I don't have a fuel canister, but I need one. And the store opens late, if at all, on Labor Day. So one of the owners just gives me his canister out of his personal pack. Good. It's just all of those little things, and you you meet really wonderful people on the trail, and people there will help you too, as we've talked before. But I really feel it with my comings and goings. Well, it's interesting because you say that about your friend coming coming two and a half hours after work, and then <laughs> and get up early and say at the airport. That is above and beyond the call of friendship. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. really wonderful and great to see her. She doesn't live near home, so it was an opportunity f- for us to get together and just do something sure, regular sure. and not regular. <laughs> and so you see your mother. Did you see any other friends back home? Um, I saw mostly family, but I spent a lot of time with um, my close friend Donna, mm-hmm. um, kayaking, drinking wine. My my family was home from Idaho, and oh. so it was good to see my sister in law a little bit extra. And yeah, it's nonstop when I'm home. <laughs> so you came back on, and it's funny because Mary, I spoke to Mary the other day, uh, and she told me she did this as well. Your my first wilderness solo cowboy camping went well, but not <laughs> but not quite as well as it should have done. Apparently, <laughs> oh. what happened? I don't know what happened. 
I have an extension uh, that goes on the end of my hiking pole for uh-huh. my tent. Right. Yeah. It's a it's a piece of PVC pipe that's I don't know twelve or fourteen inches long, and I had it this morning. I took it out of my bag because I didn't use it. You know, you pack explosion every day because if you don't use it every day, you don't need it. So. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know what happened to it. It was on my ground cloth and I think I might've picked up my ground cloth and it was windy. So I'm you know, death grip on my ground oh, cloth yeah. and I think it might've flipped down the rocks. And I didn't see it or hear it. And I went back, I dropped my pack and went back and looked for it and I couldn't find it. Isn't it funny though, Joe, we, we do tend to look after stuff almost obsessively when we're out there because you know we don't want to lose it and you can't just immediately replace it. So what are you going to do in terms of a um, if that's what you use to put your tent up, what are you going to do now? Um, I can still pitch my tent, but it, and if I can find a rock to put or something under there, um, under my pole, it's the center pole, right. it'll be okay. But I can still pitch it, but the edges will be sitting on the ground, which means there's going to be condensation inside. And uh, it's just not not how I prefer to do it, for yeah. sure. So how was, the, how, was the, how was the solo cowboy camping then, apart from losing that? <laughs> well, first it was dark, and then the moon came up, and it wasn't dark. But the first thing I saw was a toad. And last time we talked, I talked about not – Shining your flashlight on things at night. Yes. <laughs> Be careful what you say, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I'm looking at the scenery still, and I see something move by my feet. So I shine the light on it. It's a big old toad, and there's a millipede and just different things. But it was good. Uh-huh. I, don't, I don't know that I had uh, any critters really bothering me or anything. So it was good. You women are amazingly brave. I would never cowboy camp. I'm a real cowboy when it comes to that. I do not want anything crawling inside my sleeping bag at night. It would be a bloody nightmare for me. And I and the thing is, I know I'd have to get out quickly. I'd be shouting and jumping around if I felt something <laughs> in my feet. So that wouldn't work for me. Work for me at all. So you you say you're near, near the top of the priest. What mile is what mile is that? How far are we going to go now? Um. I'm at mile 1368, and did you ask how far I'm going today? No, I meant how far are you going to go, but 1368 is the number, right? Yeah, okay, you still still got a ways to go then. So what's your next – I'm trying to think what your next big stop is because I can't think of the trail going south. I can't think of it going north, which is uh, not very good. Um, what, what's your next big um, – what's your next stop? Um, I think it's going to be down by Glasgow. The Glasgow, Glasgow area. Oh, nice, nice. There's some good places to stay there as well. Okay, well, look, lovely to catch up. Glad you, glad you're doing well. I'm glad you, um, <laughs> glad the toe didn't get in your bloody sleeping bag with you. Nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll catch up soon. Okay. Okay, good, Steve. Thank you. Cheers, then. Bye. Bye, bye. I could really detect that she was missing a regular life and guess that going home to meet up with friends and family just exacerbates that homesickness. That's one of the things that few of us ever prepare for because you can't prepare for that really. You know you're going to miss family but it's difficult to imagine what that means to those of us who aren't service people, more used to separation. When you're planning your hike you might like to consider what that separation might mean to you and your family. And by the way... (laughs) Does that woman ever rest? She went home and went kayaking. Oh my God, she's unstoppable. And talking of unstoppable, Mary Marks is about to enter an iconic part of the trail. Here she is. Hi, Steve. Hey, Mary. <laughs> How are you? How's it going? Oh, I'm good. How are you? Oh, uh, you are. You are just moving on. You, and you, just tell everybody where you are now. I am in Monson, Maine at Shaw's Hostel. How's that feel? Oh my gosh, unbelievable. It's it's kind of sad but joyous at the same time. <laughs> well, I bet it is. You know, I I remember the feeling when I I stayed there quite a few nights actually and um and because I kept coming back in from the, I got somebody to pick me up for the first three or four days in the hundred mile wilderness when I did it first time, which probably isn't the best way to do it. But I remember the feeling 
was of all people knowing they're near the end and they all sit around and talk in almost hushed voices, but still excitement because they know this is, they're getting there. Have you met many other hikers in Shores? Oh, I have. Um, many hikers that I have been bouncing, you know, different little trail families I've been bouncing back and forth with mm. um, have been here. And, yeah, it's just been great. Just a nice reunion, um, uh, saying goodbyes. Uh, Mark caught up to me the other night at, uh, at on Moxie uh, Bald Mountain. Oh, really? All right. And, yeah, so, so we camped at the same campsite that night. And then he was heading into Mont, and I said, "Oh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna be an extra day." But uh, then I ended up doing 18 miles because you know it was a pretty easy walk in. So we got to uh, see each other tonight and said goodbye this morning, and that yeah, was it. Was really nice to see. Him. So he's gone into the hundred mile wilderness without bloody telling me. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 there. Oh dear. So since we last spoke. Um, I know you, um, and you, you, you said you got a note you sent me saying that you went over the Bigelows, which I absolutely think were just magnificent mountains. Would you find them tough? Because they're not easy, are they? They did. They were hard. <laughs> <laughs> they were hard. The nicest part was after you hike over them and get to um, the, an, an area, you can look back and, and see them. Yes. You know, you could see Avery, Avery Peak yeah. of the two Bigelows. They're kind of daughty, aren't they? They are. They are, because they're the largest ones in that area. Yeah, yeah. But that's, you know, that, as you say, that's the last of the big big ones until Qatar Nichols, which you knock your socks off. But, you know, you're, 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 you're still, you know, you finish with the big ones until the last one. So that's a, that's a nice thing to know. So you haven't got any anything really that bad now until – uh, for about another 110, 12 miles, something like that. And you stayed at right, yeah. you stayed at Harrison's Pierce Pond Camp. It, it, did you stay at the shelter or at the camp itself? At the camp itself. Well, I I didn't think you could do that. Is that are they open to hikers now? Well, he has a couple spots available for hikers. Right. So the night I hiked in, Pierce Pond Camp was totally full with uh, a group of section hikers, right. or day hikers. Right. And so I, I decided to go down and say, hey, I, you know, sign me up for breakfast. But it was already 6.30, and I wasn't about to go back up <laughs> a quarter mile. And yeah. look at the so, so I said, do you have a cabin available? And he goes, no, they're all rented out, and they're ready for the next people coming in. And I'm kind of like, oh, can I sleep on your floor? <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, oh, no, I don't do that. He didn't want to start uh, having hikers sleep on how the huts will let you uh, work per se. Right. So he let me sleep on his porch. Oh, you know what? That's fine. That works, doesn't it? It was. It worked wonderful. And, of course, he makes that wonderful breakfast. Yes. Yes. Did you fill up on that? (laughs) I did. I absolutely did. <laughs> Quite right so. Quite right so. And and so you've you've done this um, uh, this thing that I've never done. You cowboy camped on Pleasant Pond Mountain. What's that all about? <laughs> it was such a beautiful day again. Not a cloud in the sky, and I've never cowboy camped. And you know, it's one of those through hiker things that people are checking off their list, you know, to stargaze and to cowboy camp. And so I set up right on one of those rock outcrops and cowboy camped and watched the sunset and the moon and the stars. It was. You are so braver than me. I'm a wuss when it comes to things like that. (laughs) I I worry about things crawling in my sleeping bag at at night. So I couldn't, I couldn't contemplate that. And I always say to, you know, people know that, you know, when when you zip, when I zip up my tent, my bug net at night, I feel totally secure in there. I wouldn't feel secure with it open at all. And actually out there cowboy camping, I know everybody does it. Everybody thinks it's a good idea to do it. Great. I wish I could add the balls to do it, but I, 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 I currently don't. I don't. I don't think I'll be grinding them before before I die. So, right. Well, it it was fun, and I slept so well that I slept through the sunrise. Oh, did you? It. Yeah. After all that. Oh dear. So the weather's obviously improved, then, Mary. 
it's improved so nice and it's drying up the mud. Of course, there's still a lot of mud, but yeah, it's course. drying up it, so it's yeah. not so bad. But now we have all the, the uh, stream crossings and and that, you know, so your feet are still wet. But yes. it's nice that there's blue skies. So is there a, is there a, a is there, do you have a strategy for the 100 mile wilderness? Or, I mean, what, what, how are you planning it? What are you going to do? I am giving myself eight days. Right. And I'm going to do a food, a food bucket. Yeah, out to four. You know, and I was going to try to do it faster, but I have, I'm ahead of schedule. Yeah. I can really take my time. I could do 10 days. In fact, I might stretch it to 10. <laughs> um, I, I packed enough food for uh-huh. nine days, so uh-huh. I, I, I don't have to kill myself to get there because I have plenty of time. And as you come to the end, because you know, it happens – it does start happening quite quickly now because you get to Abel Bridge and that's still another week and a bit away. You get to Abel Bridge and then you really got that very short walk and then you're at Katahdin and it's in your face and you go up it and it's over. How are you, how are you feeling? I, mean, I know you've, you've had a great time and so on. Are you, are you a bit nervous it's going to be over? Oh, I am nervous. I, I am nervous just because of the 100 mile wilderness and that it's going to be coming to an end. Uh, and uh, everything has just fallen into place so well for me this entire trip. I, yeah. You know, I, I just wanted to go smoothly and go have fun and um, not be too sad about it. <laughs> yeah. know, I'm anxious, anxious to get home, but yeah, it's going to be it's a whole different way of life again, getting back into a different routine. Yeah. Do you think it's changed you much? <sighs> I think I've learned a lot more patience. That's the word Mark said, actually, funny enough. He said patience was a thing he'd learned as well. <laughs> yes, he did, yeah. Yeah, a different type of patience. You know, I've always been fairly a patient person, but patience in a different way where I don't have to have things right now. Right, right. You, know, you learn to adapt to your situation, and, well, that's the way it is because you have no choice. Yes. You know, you have to accept it. My thing has always been having fewer choices is so much easier. It makes life so much simpler, <laughs> doesn't it? If you haven't got the choice, then it doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about it anymore, do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Oh, so tonight you're going you're gonna to go down the pub to eat and meet up with people? I don't think so. Huh? No, I'm, I'm not that kind of social butterfly. No, I, um, I kind of tend to... I hang out at the hostels and, and, and socialize here, but right. I, I probably won't go to the pub. Right. No. Right. Well, look, enjoy these days. These are special, special days. And I've said it the last couple of weeks, but they really are special days. And, you know, you're, and you're, you're, you'll have a great time, I'm sure. Whether we can catch up next week, I don't know. Depends where you are. You never know. You might get a signal. You might not. The service is uh, a little sketchy, from what I'm told. Yeah, and it's not. It's, this isn't. This isn't great sound at the moment either. But we're getting most of it, which is good. And I can edit, edit some stuff, stuff when it doesn't sound quite right. But look, you know, just enjoy it, and I know, I know you will. And if you can get through, great. If you can't, that's okay. It's all good. Whenever you can get through, though, let me know. So I'd love to speak to you before you okay. go up Katahdin, if possible. Okay. All right. I will do that. Okay, Mary. Well, uh, all right. enjoy enjoy yourself and say hi to everybody and wish yes. them wish them all luck because these are special days. All right. Yes, sir. You. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Cheers, then, Mary. Bye. Bye. So both Mary and Joanne have cowboy camped. I'm still much of a wuss. I generally like to experience it, but so far I just haven't been brave enough. What an adventure she's having, and she's kind of experiencing what I saw several times on the trail. She wants to slow down. As I think I said, this all goes very fast from now, and you want to be living for the moment, now more than ever. Mary's got the time, so she's going to take the time. So great to hear from her again. And it was Mary who brought Dr. Lynn back to the show this week. She sent me a text about a subject I had never considered, trench foot. She specifically asked what Lynn would think, so I called Lynn. She did some further research. So let's hear what Dr. Lynn has to say about Mary's trench foot. Okay, as promised, on a limited run, <laughs> we've, got, we've got Dr. Lynn back. Hey, Lynn, how are you? I'm all right. Doing very well, thanks. 
Well, you've had a long day, I know. You've been working and you've you've been doctoring all day long. So uh, hopefully uh, you, you're a little bit more relaxed. You can talk about something also to do with doctoring. Um, this was raised by Mary, one of our Mighty Blue Class of 23. She talked about, and I wonder whether you could help help her out with the idea about um, trench foot, which is something I only ever thought was from the First World War. So talk to me about trench foot. Sure thing. Um I got your email about Mary having difficulties with trench foot and asking for advice. And I thought this might be a great little topic for uh, us hikers. And I would like to um, do a shout out to the vets. First of all, uh, thank you for your service. And second of all, you could probably skip over these next 15 minutes because you've learned all about this in basic training. All oh, right. Um, okay. <laughs> and for the rest of us civilians who are hiking the trail, I honestly didn't realize that this was as big a deal and probably a lot more common than we all think about. We all talk about ticks. We talk about lightning yeah. strikes. We talk about hypothermia. This is actually on kind of along those lines of hypothermia and frostbite as I was doing some of the research. So uh, thank you, Mary, for bringing this topic to our attention. It's funny, actually. Um, it's something that we've all been hearing about the dreadful weather you've had, obviously, in Connecticut and Vermont and throughout the you know, New England states and so on this year. And I'm sure this has been so prevalent because it's been raining nonstop for, for about a month, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been really crazy. Of course, now everything is dried up, and now we're hearing that a lot of the water sources are getting yes, dry. Right, yes, Gee. go figure, go figure. Right? Well, so uh, trench foot is actually one of three types of immersion foot injuries, right. and trench foot is officially called non-freezing cold injury, hmm. and uh, the other two. Immersion foot injuries are warm water immersion foot and tropical immersion foot. So the most common one that we would probably see on the Appalachian Trail is the non-freezing cold injury, or as we say, trench foot. Mm -hmm. It's caused by exposure to cold and damp. So you have to have both of those things. It's different from frostbite in that the it occurs where the water temperature is between 32 degrees and 59 degrees. So it's hmm. not freezing. It's not below freezing. That's right. where the difference is. But it can develop in as little as about 10 hours of exposure. And what does exposure mean? Does that mean when your foot has got wet in that water for a period of time or it stays in there or you can't dry your feet out? Or what, how, what does that exposure actually mean? Yes, to both of those. Um, it has to be exposed to cold and damp. It can be in your in your shoes, you know, in your boots. So you can have wet socks that are inside wet boots sure. exposed for the full day if you're hiking for the full 10 hours. That can um, lead to trench foot if it's not properly treated. Right, okay. And uh, you'll notice itching, tingling, numbness, Feet, if you take your socks off, feet can look like reddish or bluish tinge. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't de- sound good at yeah, all. Yeah, <laughs> depending on the state of the phase of the blood supply. And this is this is also in people who have a darker skin color as well. If you look at the sole of the foot, that's much lighter than the, the top of the foot. You yeah. can see that difference. Wow. The feet can also swell. And sometimes they can swell so much that it can be t- difficult to put your boots back on. So what is causing the swelling there then, Lynn? Is it is it the it's not it's not absorbing water and swelling with the water, is it, I presume? So what it, what actually is causing the swelling? Well, actually the water absorption is part of it. Oh wow. Yep. That uh you can get literally waterlogged. That's actually important when we talk about warm water immersion right. foot and tropical immersion foot. But because you get the water logged, the changes in the um dynamics of the blood vessels. Uh, the pressure will cause the blood vessels to be irritated and they could be compromised. The pressure of the water will cause the nerves to be uh, compromised as well. And so those things also will create swelling of the feet. Hmm. Okay. So the, the water, the 
the blood supply and the nerve supply all work together to create swelling of the feet. All right. So how do you how do you treat that though then? Straightforward, take your shoes off, dry your feet, put on dry clean socks. That's a difficult bit, isn't that, it? That that is Mo- a difficult thing. Yep. Yeah. Cuz most hikers tend to have, well, I say most hikers, I <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of other hikers take one shirt or two shirts, one pair of underpants and one, two pairs of socks probably. And that's about it for most people. So you're saying if, if you've get, got bad conditions, try to keep two two pairs of socks dry so you can change them, you know, at the end of the day and also partway during the day? Mm-hmm. And oh. there's a very straightforward evidence of this. The, in World War One, when they first mm-hmm. discovered or first realized what trench foot was all about and also how to improve it, they had a dramatic reduction in the number of trench foot incidents when they started a couple of things. Number one, each soldier was given three pairs of socks every day. Good and they Lord. had to change their socks out. Wow. And they were given a what I call a foot buddy. Basically, one of their <laughs> one of their um, you know, guys, one of the other they they would have buddies where the other buddy would say, hey, did you change your socks lately? Like, oh. oh, I should do that. Somebody to remind you, change your socks. And they put dry socks on, and it was a dramatic reduction. Well, so, so take us out of the trenches then and put us yeah. in camp. So ha- ha- put us on the trail. How, how, how would you manage that sort of thing? Or is it just a case of having fresh or at least dry socks twice a day? You should take two extra pairs of socks. Um, Mm. that should be the minimum so that Um. you have, um, a pair that you're wearing and you could, you could theoretically get through a day's hiking in the wet socks and wet boots. But the most important thing is when you come into camp, you take off those wet boots, take off those wet socks, dry your feet, inspect your feet, make sure there's not any cuts or blisters. And if there are, you should probably treat them. Uh, with a you know, wash your feet if you can, but most importantly, dry your feet. And then if it's cool out, put on a dry pair of clean socks. It's really important if you can possibly do it at all, don't go to bed with dirty socks. That's another thing apparently that's in the um, the, the vet's manual. Put on a pair, a pair of clean socks if you're going to bed. Wow. Um, Once again, also not easy. You know, they're, it, they're not that available. So, so it, it's, it's funny. But actually, you, you should have a pair of sleep socks. That right, that's yeah. all you do is you sleep in them, and yes. you don't use them unless it's an absolute emergency. You always I did that them. second to, a second time, and it made a lot of difference to me as well. I must admit, yeah, right, right, interesting. Okay. And so then you have that third pair that hopefully the first the pair that you wore that during the day they will dry out. They don't have to be clean. But they do have to be dry. <laughs> yeah. I, I I know when I when I did my hike um, back in twenty one, I would put my my hiking socks up in my tent. There's a, this little pocket up at the top. It was almost like a little clothesline. And in the morning, they would be dry. They'd be stiff as a board because of all the salt and sweat. But they would be dry, and mm. I would put them on, and they would be okay. And one thing you've got in the notes here, which which kind of surprised me that it would be part of it, adequate hydration nutrition, which we know is good for us anyway. You say it's particularly important to keep the blood circulating and keep the body functioning at optimum health. Mm-hmm. And that helps with the actual the repair of your feet as well, does it? Exactly. It helps oh. with the new, the hydration is good because that keeps the circulation going well. The nutrition is good because all the little cells that are in your muscles and your nerves and your blood vessels and your skin need to have good uh, nutrients in order to maintain optimum functioning. Okay. So what about the warm water one? Warm water immersion foot is when the water itself that's that you're exposed to is between 60 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That they discovered mostly in Vietnam. Sure. Um, and there's this great piece in, what is it, Forrest Gump, where Forrest Gump and Bubba meet Lieutenant Dan for the first time. And the, one of the first things he talks about is socks. 
You need three pairs of, <laughs> I think, what is this, a double O green or OF green or something like that. He goes on and on and says, change your socks. <laughs> and my brother reminded me of this. And I went back and I looked at the clip and I said, oh my gosh, this is hysterical. I have to make sure. So everybody go onto YouTube, look at that clip about socks and Lieutenant Dan, and you'll see exactly what it's all about. <laughs> um, and then that's not as bad as tropical immersion foot where you're in the warm water but you're in the warm water for more than 72 hours wow this is where your feet really can get waterlogged um and the the water that's in your skin and in your muscles will again cause the compression of your nerves and your blood vessels it's unlikely that a hiker is going to have his have the feet Immer- not immersed in water, but in, in wet shoes, or well, maybe whatever, in wet shoes over a period of days, wouldn't they? Is that what it is? Putting it back into, putting your putting your feet back into wet shoes that really means you're going to get wet all the time? Because I, u- I used waterproof shoes. I know everybody says you shouldn't, but I use them on both my hearts. Never got a single blister. So go figure. Um, yeah. So, but, yeah. but of course, if it, they did get soaked, if they did get wet and water went, up, went, went in from the top, they wouldn't be wet for the rest of the day. They always were. Right, so right. That was, because that that's problem. the problem with the waterproof shoes is that they don't allow sure. it to sure. to breathe. Yeah. Um, treatment of both of these can include the most important thing is to dry your feet, um, let them air out, put on dry socks, uh, treat any little uh, nicks or blisters. If your feet are swollen, Elevate them. If you're going to be sleeping, put put your backpack under your feet and and elevate them above uh, heart height. You can also use uh, my favorite ibuprofen <laughs> because it does help right with too. <laughs> it does help with swelling and pain, uh, and it, and it can re- as I said, it can reduce the the inflammation, which helps reduce the pressure that's on the blood vessels and the nerves. Is there any is there any long term damage on this? I mean, or is it a case of how long you're exposed to it? Can it can it can it be not irreversible, but can it be pretty tricky for quite a period of time after you've had this problem for I don't know seventy two hours or whatever? It actually can. This is not just a matter of oh, I'll dry my feet out and I'll be fine. Sure, you can get enough damage sustained to permanently damage your blood vessels and your nerves where it can be painful for you to walk. It can be so that you get chronic swelling in your feet. Uh, this could really seriously affect you. There have been instances of uh, vets who have needed to go on uh, to be um, discharged medically because they have had such severe cases of Good Lord. Uh, immersion foot. Yeah. Do you know what, Lynn, I don't know about you, but I've never heard this. Some I've never heard this mentioned on any of my shows from a hiker, it's the first time I've ever heard it. And is that is that a reflection of how how wet it's been up there this year and all the crossings they're having to do? I agree with you. I haven't heard it either. And when Mary first mentioned it, I thought, hmm. And I don't know if people just have not realized that that's what they have. Uh, and fortunately, Probably, yeah. they got over it. And it was they just said, "Oh, my feet are wet. My feet have gotten an infection or something like that," and they got treated, and they didn't realize sure. it. I mean, the warm water one and the tropical one are less likely to infect affect hikers. I mean, the one that I suspect Mary's probably got is because it's been cold and uh, relatively cold, and uh, the water crossings have been so severe recently. Exactly. I would find it very hard to believe that people on the Appalachian Channel are going to get the warm water foot injury, uh, warm water yeah. immersion foot, but the the trench foot, the non freezing cold injury, I think is a lot more common than we all realize. Well, so the big takeaway, as far as I can hit what I'm hearing you say, uh, is that instead of taking two pairs of socks and just, just switch them in, take three pairs of socks, keep two of them dry, which is quite a change. In a, it, will, it will certainly be a change to my my setup, and I'll certainly think about go, think about that going forward. Yeah, I I know that I'm going to add a, a third pair of socks. Um, as a matter of fact, at the end of this month, I'm going on an AT backpacking medicine conference. I know you're the, going to come and tell us about it as well. Yeah, with the Wilderness Medical Society, and nice. and they. On the list is three pairs of socks. They, they, you know, the, the kit list, and they say, you know, bring a, 
a long sleeve or a short sleeve, or, you know, whatever, but specifically three pairs of socks. Interesting. There's no other article on that list that says how many you're supposed to bring. Good Lord. I tell, I tell you what, we, we, we should have got into contact with Darn Tough before, should we? Get him to sponsor this, this particular episode. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, as always, lovely to see you, Lynn, and I appreciate you coming on and, and helping Mary out with that. Because I, I sent her the paper you've already you've already sent you've already uh, sent me, and uh, this I'm going to put this in the file, and it'll be linkable um, in in the show notes as well. So it's a really important subject. So we'll see you again when you come and talk about the uh, about this course you're going on. Wonderful. Looking okay. forward to it. Good talk to you, Lynn. See you then. Bye bye. Bye. She's so great, isn't she? I always feel I've learned something when Lynn's on the show and she presents it with such clarity that even I work out the takeaways. Lovely to have her back on the show. She prepared a little Word document for you to read further and I've added it to the other documents she's written. Apparently, you have to ask permission to access the file and of course I'll grant it when I get the email. So there you go. Two dry pairs of socks. Who knew? Oh, and by the way, I've added the Forrest Gump clip to the show notes. And indeed, <laughs> Lieutenant Dan really does emphasise Forrest and Bubba's feet. Thanks, as always, goes to this week's donors with recurring patrons, Anne Dobson, Mike DiCello, Alan Troy, Jens Lippeheide, Lisa Runner, Brian Helton Jr., Woody Bess, and Natisha Webb sticking with us, while Kevin Honeycutt also generously slipped a number of bucks our way. Thanks to you all for your support. Now, let's move on to our final two members of the Class of 23. Mark Carpenter is a day or so ahead of Mary, so it was great to hear from him when he was in the 100-mile wilderness. Here's Mark. Hey, Mighty Blue, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great. Good, good, good. And you're in the 100-mile wilderness. A day you thought would yes. never, a day we all thought never was never going to come, but you're there. <laughs> oh, I'm dear. here. Let's look back. Um, you say you slap packed 17 miles over the big lows. That's a long way, but isn't that also, isn't that some great hiking up there? Oh, yeah. It was fantastic. It was, I mean, the weather has finally been fantastic for a good stretch. That and, time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was great. And uh, so many beautiful views. You know, st- stayed on top of Avery and um, yeah. had some lunch up there. Yeah. And then Little Bigelow. It was just beautiful day. Long day. Beautiful. It was unexpected for me. You know, I was expecting the highlight to be New Hampshire. And maybe it was in, in, in the totality, but there were some great moments. And the Bigelows are one of my real favorites, an, an unexpected favorite for me. And, and I think it's probably because at the time – I must have been feeling strong by then because I got up there fairly easy, even though it was quite a tough hike, you know? Yeah, definitely a tough hike. But, you know, you make a good point. I have, I am feeling like really strong yeah. hiking wise. And I think the weather helps, but I yeah. think uh, of all the other miles, it finally <laughs> turned me into a hiker. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a long time coming, though, isn't it, for all of us, I think. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And and you say the weather's been great and expected to be good until at least the weekend. And that you, you shuttle across the Kennebec with an after hour canoe ride. How'd that happen? Because you're not meant to do that. You're meant to be there at a certain time and you obviously weren't. Yeah, yeah. You're supposed to be there between nine and two. Yeah. And uh, I was running a little behind schedule and I was debating whether to to stop at the shelter and, and do the Harrison pancakes in the morning. Mm. But I know there was a lot of a lot of people gonna be uh fighting over those pancakes right so i contacted through uh, on the far out app they had a name of a, a gentleman named mike he lives on the river at the point on the river and the lake and i texted him if he would be available at four o'clock and oh. yeah he brought his canoe out and so, <laughs> so you saw so you sort of ubered the Kennebec as a, yeah. <laughs> as opposed exactly. to the regular yeah. a regular. So you realise you missed a you missed a white blaze then because the white blaze is in the middle of the bloody canoe that takes you across. Oh no! <laughs> yes, you haven't touched <laughs> every canoe. white blaze. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> oh, and um, Mary told me that you caught up with her on the way to Moxie Board, and um, yeah, that that must be. She said it was great to see you and to feel connected because of you know that the pop being part. Of part of our, our show and so on. Um, it's nice to see people on the trail that you haven't seen for a while, isn't it, as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was great to see her. And then we ended up uh, camping at the same shelter that evening. 
Yes, and I, I'm not terribly sure what this means. Oh, I, I've now reread it, actually. Yeah. Heard Bigfoot in the middle of the night, but, but <laughs> yeah. I know exactly what that sound is. It's a beautiful sound, the loons. You've never heard them before? Yeah. No, they don't. I don't haven't uh, haven't heard loons in Ohio. Right, and, uh, right. I was, what the heck is that? Is that moose? I had no idea. So uh, my story is it was Bigfoot. <laughs> it's a it's very pl- <laughs> it's a plaintive sort of cry, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it sure is. It kind of eerie. Like a, yeah, exactly. So, and I ask this of Mary as well. As you as you, as you approach shores, you know this is. We're getting round down to the nitty gritty now. This is you know the hundred mile wilderness, and then the six, the twelve or so, ten or twelve miles to uh, the base of Catan, then up Catan, and and you're nearly you're nearly done. Was there a bit of um an atmosphere um in Monson about you know everyone get exciting for the for the end, end coming up? Yeah, I think so. A lot of people, were, you know, talking about they're tired, but they they're also excited yeah. for the hundred mile wilderness, and and once. For me, once you make your arrangements, uh, like the, where you're going to stay, sure. um, well, how you're going to get home, I mean, the, it's a level of comfort that, that I got that in place. Right. Now I'm just going to enjoy this 100-mile wilderness yes. and get up to Qatar. Yeah. Well, look, in, you know, make sure you do enjoy it because, I, I, for me, it was a shock to me how – much better it was than I'd imagined it would be because I didn't do it first time. I went back to shores each night for the first four nights. Oh. But but really, the the second time, I just love it being in there. And you've d- you've already sorted out your resupply with shores. Are they going to come in after? How many days are you actually going to going to resupply? How are you going to work it out? Uh, I think Thursday I'm going to get my resupply. So I had planned for like six days through the hundred mile wilderness. Right. Okay. Not too and, not, not too bad then. Yeah. And boy, last night I. Uh, I Stealth camped up near the barren ledges. Oh, and they gorgeous, had gorgeous, a beautiful up there. sunset. Nice, beautiful, nice. Are you by yourself at the moment, or are you with somebody? Uh, I'm by myself, but there's several people around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were you were the only were you the only one up there in the south camp? Yes. Oh, yeah, it was nice. Barren Ledges is one of my favourite photos of the trip. I know I always say I've got favourites here and favourites there, but you know, <laughs> when less you guys talk about certain places, I, when I saw that note, I took a had a quick look at my picture, and it's just a magnificent view from Barren Ledges. It, 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 that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and um, you went we going back to Shores or going back to Monson. You went to the ATC. Is that a big office there? Because I seem to remember it was quite a small. When I when I yeah. went there, maybe I'm wrong. Um, tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, no, no, you're right on. It's a really small office, but Wendy, who works there, she's phenomenal. All right, she'll do anything that uh, any way you, she can assist you. Nice. She was great. She helped me get a parking pass right. for uh, my son, who will be there on the 11th, and then she explained how everything works. Really set my mind at ease. I feel real comfortable now. And how things are going to work. So the eleventh is next Monday. Yeah, you're going to have to get. A, so are you are you day two or now in the hundred mile wilderness? Are you on yeah, day two now? Okay, eight. fine. Yes, yeah. okay, that that makes more sense. So September the eleventh. That's obviously such a resonant day with Americans and and the whole world really in many in many ways. Are you pleased yeah. you're going to be something on that day? Yeah. Yeah, I started looking at it. That I had the opportunity to possibly make it that day, right. and I think um, so. I was going to go for it because it also, since I had a firefighting background, it also gives me an opportunity, kind of just honored those that we lost uh, yes. during nine eleven. Exactly, and, yeah. I, and, I, and I, when I saw that, I thought, yes, he was a fireman as well. Yeah, that's a pretty special time. For you to do it, and I'm sure that'd be quite. It's going to be emotional for you anyway. You're going to be with your son. You're going to be finishing this long journey, and uh, <laughs> you'd be you'd be regretful in many ways as well as you'll be happy. You know, you'd be happy to be going home. Um, I'm not sure you're going to be able to do this, or you're even going to want to do it. But I'd really love to have a pretty instant reaction. So, if you find yourself a nice sunshine at the top of Katahdin. <laughs> I'd okay. love I'd love you to call me and say oh, Katarn and then just talk about it. Just it'd be tremendous okay. to do. I'm going to be make sure I'm going to be around because you'll be going up in the morning, so you won't be up till about ten thirty unless you go terribly early. So I'll, I'll make sure I'm around, ready to record any time from eight a.m. in the morning, and I'll just I'll make sure I'm I'm here. Okay, 
Okay, that man. sounds great. But enjoy these days. As I said to you the other day, these are special days. So you know, just have a have a blast. Don't don't wish it by too by too quickly because it will come soon enough, and soon it will start receding into the distance of, as well. So just enjoy <laughs> it while you can. Okay. Yeah, loving it. Okay, man. Okay, good to good to talk right. to you. Okay, take it easy. Okay. Cheers. Right. Then. Bye. Nice Finishing on 9-11 as a firefighter is going to make it a doubly emotional day for Mark. I mean, it's already emotional enough. I put it in my schedule to keep Monday morning clear in an attempt to hear from him soon after his summits. As you've heard here over the years, what you think you're going to feel at that brown sign isn't always what you actually feel. There's an array of competing emotions going on at that time, and I hope we get to hear that initial reaction from Mark and hopefully Mary a few days later. Exciting times. Finally today, and I promise that we'll be hearing from George Stephanos next week, we caught up with Jessica Lang Wright, who I think it's fair to say has been put through the emotional ringer on her hike this year. <laughs> now, as I wrote that, I didn't realise at the time how appropriate the word ringer was. You're going to find out now. Hello. Jessica, hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Steve? Uh, I'm very good. And uh, you're going to give us a bit of real AT charm here because you're doing this recording. Where are you? I'm in a laundromat in Bethel, Maine. Nice. There we <laughs> are. You're just living the life, living the dream, eh? <laughs> totally. 100%. Oh, well, you sent me some great notes this week. Um, and I knew you were coming up to some really, really difficult hiking. So where do you want to start? How about the Wildcats? Because I seem to remember that was pretty, pretty tricky. Yeah, that was definitely an experience. Um, I knew that they were going to be hard because, again, just being from New Hampshire and knowing that they're on the 44,000 footers list, people right. talk about them a lot. Um, but like so much of this, you just don't know until you really experience it for yourself. Of course. So we uh, started out, and the first thing I noticed was that after – climbing down Mount Madison in that crazy storm that we climbed down, I had apparently snapped off the tips of my trekking poles oh. and I hadn't even noticed. Oh, so, so my trekking poles are kind of skittering off the rocks Just what you need. we're trying to climb up. Just yeah, what you need. Um, yeah. At perfect timing, right? But, you know, yet another part of the living the life, I guess. Um, so yeah, we're so we're going up this what is the steepest mile on the AT, and yeah. this was really the first time like we had done that south side of South Kinsman, and there were plenty of other sort of sketchy places, but this was the first time I was really scared because wow. the just the angle of some of the rocks yeah. Yeah. was so steep, and there's nothing to hold on to, and my poles are screwed up, and. There's one kind of famous spot where it's sort of this book corner and there's there's pretty much nothing to grab onto. And you just <laughs> kind of look at it and think like, how on earth am I going to do this? And if I had a day pack, okay, one thing, but I have a 35 pound backpack with a bear canister piled on top. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. And, you know, obviously we managed, but it was definitely one of the scariest climbs that we had done well you you know you kind of knew these were these were coming didn't you so you know it's i'm not saying you know you should have expected it because but it but it is it, this is getting tougher you know i no, everyone knows it's not easy and also apparently you still got a lot of mud as well so it, that must be making yeah. things a bit trickier as well it definitely has um the bog boards that are you know scattered throughout new hampshire and into maine uh they're treacherous mm. and I know there are places in New Hampshire where they cover them with chicken wire before they put them down, and that makes traction a lot easier. Sure. Um, but none of these have that. So, oh, so you're trying not to like slide off these things. They're angled at weird angles and stuff. Um, in this last stretch, I, you know, used my trekking poles to check out where they were at one point, and then summarily missed and sunk in almost 
to my knee. Um, and then you're like scrambling, trying to get yourself out and there's nothing to hold on to. And it's, yeah. It is pretty it's grim, isn't it? It's pretty grim when you fall in those things. It, it, it's, oh, I mean, I, I, I've done that myself and, I, and I've, I found it to be extreme, extremely unpleasant. And of course, it, it dries on you, which is even worse. <laughs> oh God. And it smells horrendous because it's, you know, rotting God only knows what for years. And yeah, it's, and I don't think anybody has gotten through these areas to this point unscathed. I'm sure. Everybody has fallen in at some yeah, point. So yeah. it's like a rite of passage, if you will. Like, okay, I've done that now. You know? But you're still doing it. You're still doing it, which is which is great. And and you you've done your first hitch of the trip, which is quite some time to do your first hitch. So what what was that about? Where'd you go? Yeah, so when we were in Gorham, uh, we basically we got through the Carters and Mariah and got down into Gorham, spent the night, and then had to get back to the trail. Um, on the way into Gorham, we had run into some people that we had known from previously that um, got us a ride. But getting out of Gorham and back onto the trail, it's a fairly significant distance. Oh, yeah. um, so, you know, first time sticking out the thumb and it was very quick. Somebody picked us up, took us right back there, knew exactly where we needed to go. Gorham's just a great trail town as far as like people knowing what's going on with AT sure, through sure, hikers. Yeah. And it, it was really funny. We got dropped off and no sooner than we had gotten dropped off than somebody pulled right up to us. Oh, do you guys need a ride? Oh, <laughs> so nice. it was, Nice. Yeah, it was really funny that way. And then you say straight after that, you had your worst mental breakdown in a long time coming out of Gorham. So what was going on? Were you you had a bit of a bit of a meltdown or what? Pretty much. Um, I think, you know, obviously we all know New Hampshire's hard. Um, the Wildcats and the Carters in particular, I don't know, they were just a lot harder than – I guess I expected it. It just took a lot out of me. And that climb out of Gorham, it's not terrible, but it's significant again. And I think I was just exhausted and just had this feeling like I cannot keep doing this. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing. Sorry. I, I should, but, you know, it no. is, but for someone who can't keep doing it, you keep in doing it. So there must be something working out for you. I, this trail won't let me leave, Steve. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I keep like saying to myself, "There's no way I can keep doing this," and then somehow I keep doing it. Keep doing it. So, yeah. And of course, you yeah. came to the famous Mahosit Notch, which you say you took four oh. hours, which is quite a long time because we took three hours and we had lunch in there, so we were real. We thought we were slow. So, was it not <laughs> fun, or was it bad weather, or what? It was fine weather, luckily. Um, we were very careful about strapping everything down to our packs and, mm. you know, stowing our trekking poles and everything. Um, it was just hard. I mean, you're up and over and through and trying to find the safest way. And, you know, again, with my back injury, sure. having to be so careful about not falling. And I did actually flip at one point and kind of banged my knee and my hip and whatnot, but luckily, like, didn't land in a way that was going to really mess me up. Um, um, yeah, it just it just took a really long time to get through there and figure it all out the safest way. And unfortunately, um, Mike had some issues getting through too. So it was, it was just, it was fun for a little while. <laughs> I remember thinking about halfway through, we were kind of like, yeah, this is kind of fun in a way. And yeah. then all of a sudden we were like, you know what? I'm kind of over it. Yeah. I just want to be done. <laughs> <laughs> but it took you four hours to be over it, so there you go. <laughs> and then yeah, you said, and this is you found two lost hikers. Who were they? Oh my gosh! So this this was crazy. So you know, it's getting late in the day, and we finally get out of there, and we start going up the Mahusik arm, and we feel like you know we've accomplished something because hey, we we survived, right? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. And then we're walking along, and the next thing we know, there are these two turned out to be teenage boys sitting on the side of the trail. And this one kid like won't even look at us. And he's like, I don't know how to say this, but we're lost and huh. we're not sure where we are. And, and it's turned into this whole thing. So basically 
these two kids had gone out. It was the one kid's first backpacking trip, which, oh, holy cow, did they pick a doozy of a spot to do their first backpacking trip. <laughs> yeah. um, they had stayed at the Speck Pond campsite that we were headed to the night before. Right. And then they were supposed to be going somewhere else, but they it didn't even sound like they were sure where they were supposed to be going. So they climbed down out of there. They must have been climbing down the arm. And then they realized like they didn't know where they were going. Their phones were almost dead. Um, So they did call for help, but as they were supposed to be giving the coordinates of where they were to emergency services, the phone goes dead. Um, The one thing that they did really well was they stayed put because somebody told them to stay put. Um, So we stumble across them. And the next thing I know, you know, the two of us basically go into emergency mode of like, okay, when's the last time you ate? Do you have water? Do you have anything to treat your water? Um, All of these things were not in place. Um, They were scared. They were hungry. They were exhausted um luckily search and rescue showed up not terribly long after we found them um mike stayed with them while i ran up there was a water source not too far away so i ran up with both of our water bags to get water so at least we could take care of that mike started fixing them one of the backpacking meals that he had in his bag so at least they would have something to eat because they hadn't had anything since breakfast basically wow. that morning. Um, and this was like four or five o'clock in the afternoon at this point. Um, and as I'm like coming down with the water, I hear somebody yelling and it turned out it was search and rescue. They sent one guy out just to try and locate these two kids. Um, uh, and he ended up walking them out. Um, wow. but we were Which way did they go? pretty well prepared. Which way do they go? Then? What's that? Which way do they go? Do they go up? Yeah, they went they went down actually. They went mm. down and I guess he knew some other side trail sure. to take them out cuz that was the other thing. I mean, the closest road was like 10 miles away at that yeah. point that I knew of. Yeah. Um wow. It's a pretty remote spot, you know, for these kids to be lost in. Well, actually there is a road out a pass going south past the not past Mahosit Notch. Because, right, but, but, because uh, but that's about a two or three mile walk to the road, and when you get to the road, it's bloody deserted anyway. So, you know, it probably yeah. wouldn't have been terribly helpful anyway. It just shows you how you, how you can go wrong. And so you went on up the the arm, and then you came down. Yep. You're the first person to ever say the old, the climb down from Old Spec was actually pretty nice. I hated it. It just went on and on and on. But you're okay with it, <laughs> were you? I think the thing to me at that point was like I I've been saying for several days at this point I would just like a little while where it didn't feel like every step was life or death you know it was like that side of things wow. was wow. almost a trail right like compared to climbing up the rock face on the other side on that like the spec pond side of yes. old spec like that sheer rock face that just goes straight up and once again there's like nothing to hold on to and my poles are skittering into nowhere and yeah i i was not a big fan of that side of well things, you are but. you are certainly getting your full taste of what what it's all about there now so look i, I yep. i've got some noises hang, hang, starting up in my house right now so i'm gonna have to say goodbye but uh look it's a great catch up, you know, and the fact you actually help these kids get off the mountain, that's terrific as well. So, you know, good, well, well done, you two. Um, just stay safe and just enjoy it, and uh, we'll catch up next week, okay? Sounds good. All right then. Cheers, Jessica. Bye. Bye. Ringer, laundry. Yeah, you probably had to be there to see how much that weak joke made me laugh. She certainly wears her heart on her sleeve, but to her eternal credit, she keeps edging forward. And what about finding those two young lads? It really shows how quickly things on a remote trail can turn in a moment. Luckily for them, Jessica and Mike were able to handle the situation. But it makes you wonder who would let two unprepared youngsters out into the main wilderness. I'm glad they were safe. So that's it. We got through it all. I don't think I quite thought through how intense following all of our class of 23 members would be, but we're coming to an end for two of them, and I'm loving catching up with them as they head for their ending. I hope you do too. I'll see you next week.